joined by Liberians Sharon Teng and Go Li Kim. Both will highlight the current trends and developments in China and in the, India through the National Library's print and digital collections. Tonight's presentation consists of two parts. The first half will focus on China and the second half will be on India. China and India are the two largest economies in Asia uh, and they also have the world's largest populations. Let's begin. These are the areas I will cover in my presentation. I will share briefly on China's country profile, highlight China's significance to Singapore and Asia, uh, ASEAN, highlight books and digital resources on economic developments and trends in China. Uh, and the following presentation is based on research using the library's print, digital, and online resources. Here are some key facts and figures on China. In terms of land mass, China is the fourth largest country in the world, but it has the world's highest population at 1.4 billion. From 2013 to 2017, China had one of the fastest growing economies in the world, averaging more than 7% real growth per year. In 2018, it achieved a GDP growth of 6.6%. According to the World Bank's 2019 Ease of Doing Business report, China ranks 46 out of 190 countries in terms of ease of doing business. China became the world's largest exporter in 2010 and the largest trading nation in 2013. Its major exports include telecoms equipment, clothing and furniture, and it exports goods, most of its goods to these four countries. China has over 600 cities which are categorized into different tiers to describe their level of development. According to the characteristics of Tier 1, these five cities qualify as Tier 1 cities. First tier cities are the most developed areas in China and are large, densely populated urban metropolises that attract investments from foreign enterprises. According to a graduate employment report, Beijing is the most attractive city for Chinese graduates, but the city's increasing cost of living is pushing them to other first tier cities such as Shanghai and Guangzhou. There are about 30 tier two cities. These cities have attracted investments from many Fortune 500 companies due to lower labor costs, less competition, and lower operating costs for retailers. Many second tier cities are also strong in particular industries. So for example, Chengdu, Shenyang, and Xi'an are strong in the aerospace industry. The characteristics of tier three and four cities are shown on the screen. This chart from Morgan Stanley shows that the household consumption for tier three and below cities in China is projected to triple by the year 2030 as compared to the more modest increase for tier one and two cities. This slide and the next three touch on the significance of China to Singapore. Before Singapore established formal diplomatic relations with China, both countries already had close economic and political ties on an informal basis. Then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew made his first official visit to China in 1976. Two years later, then Chinese Vice Premier Teng Xiaoping visited China, uh, Singapore in 1978. Teng had identified Singapore as an early role model as he was impressed with how much Singapore had developed since gaining independence in 1965. Singapore and China signed a trade agreement in 1979 and trade representative offices were established in 1981. These were later upgraded into embassies and ambassadors were exchanged after diplomatic relations were formalized in 1990. Over the decades, both countries have strengthened bilateral ties in areas such as economics, business, arts, culture, education, and the environment. We have also established several high-level institutional mechanisms to deepen cooperation and friendship between both countries. Singapore was the first Asian country to have a comprehensive bilateral free trade accord with China. In October uh, 2008, the China-Singapore Free Trade Agreement was signed. Since 2013, China has been Singapore's largest trading partner, while Singapore is China's largest foreign investor. To date, Singapore and China have collaborated on three government-to-government -government projects as shown on the screen. We have also collaborated on another group of projects which are led by the private sector. These include 
Guangzhou Knowledge City, Sichuan High Tech Innovation Park, and the Nanjing Eco High Tech Island. DPM Tio Chi Hian recently said that there are many opportunities for Singapore and China to further broaden and deepen bilateral cooperation. Both countries are drafting new legal initiatives and cooperation for commercial transactions and can complement each other's efforts to use innovative new technology to improve the lives of citizens and explore greater cooperation in smart cities development. To read up more on the development of Singapore's relationship with China, you can refer to the books featured on this slide. All of these books are on display and you are welcome to browse through them after our presentation. China and ASEAN have a long-established relationship and after the China-ASEAN free trade area was launched in 2010, both sides have benefited tremendously in terms of trade and tourism exchanges. In 2018, the trade volume between China and ASEAN reached $587 billion. Since 2009, China has been the largest trading partner of ASEAN. And since 2012, China has been ASEAN's largest source of foreign tourists. China and ASEAN have also exchanged and leveraged on technology and agriculture and will deepen cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative in terms of infrastructure and digital collaboration. To read up more on the development of China's relationship with ASEAN, you can also refer to the books on this slide. These are also on display at the front of the room. Next, I will touch on the growth of China and its development. China has made unprecedented socio-economic progress over the past four decades. Between 1980 to 2012, China's economy grew at an average of 10% every year, and its GDP per capita increased from 250 to over $9,000. Over the same period, foreign direct investment to China increased from $3.4 billion to $121 billion. In 2010, China surpassed Japan to become the world's second largest economy. By 2011, China was ranked number one in merchandise exports, number two in merchandise imports, and was the number one destination for inward foreign direct investment among developing countries. Overall, China's total value of trade increased 144 times from 1978 to 2010. How did China achieve this? Since the 1980s, China has used a mixture of socialist and capitalist mechanisms domestically and has liberalized trade and foreign uh, investment internationally. Today, China is regarded as an economic superpower. The map on the left from the Lowy Institute shows that by 2030, China is projected to overtake the US as a regional power in Asia. In the chart on the right from IMF, China now has a larger economy than the US in terms of purchasing power parity. These print and online sources highlight China's growth as a regional and economic power. The article from the World Economic Forum says that China is in the process of surpassing the US economically. From 2017 to 2019, China will contribute 35% contribute of global GDP growth versus 18% from the US. According to the journal article from ProQuest Central, the world, book, uh, world power will shift to the east in the 21st century with China as the key driver. China's GDP has surpassed that of the US, its belt and road projects are underway, and it's not only increasing its presence in Africa, but it's also focusing on soft power projection in other parts of the world. The first book examines China's changing role on the international stage. Written by China specialists from around the globe, they analyze China's engagement with the world in terms of its foreign policy, its approach to international economic affairs and international security. The second volume contains a collection of essays, speeches, and papers written by Chinese, Chinese scholars on China's foreign policy, national security, and foreign economic relations. Peacekeeping is a non-coercive way to project influence around the globe, from playing almost no role in the United Nations peacekeeping missions 20 years ago, China is today the largest troop contributor by far. The two articles on the left of the screen provide details of China's involvement and contributions to the United Nations. China became a member of the UN in 1971 and op occupies a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Since 1995, China has become increasingly active in the UN Security Council and is the third largest contributor to their regular budget. 
China's participation in UN operations demonstrates its commitment to global stability and corresponds with the Chinese government's efforts to enhance China's international image through increased participation in global governance. China became a member of WTO in 2001. By 2015, China was a key player in WTO, participating actively in multilateral rule enforcement and trade dispute settlements. The memo from the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission uh, on the right of the screen lists some of the key international organizations where Chinese nationals play leadership roles in. The concept of soft power was coined by an American political scientist in 1990. As compared to hard power, soft power is non-coercive. It co-ops, persuades, attracts, and appeals to others to support the country's interests using culture, political values, and foreign policies. These resources highlight China's interpretation and application of soft power both domestically and internationally. According to the first book, for the Chinese government, Soft power is first and foremost culture, and its cultural dimension is embedded in the very phrase Wen Hua Ran Shi Li, which means cultural soft power. The second book examines how Chinese, China's soft power is translated on screen via dramas, movies, news media, reality TV, and online digital cultures. The article from the Austrian Economics Center traces the development of Chinese soft power from the 1990s to the present. For China, soft power policy comprises two core components. The first is the promotion of Chinese culture globally in order to build a better image of the country. The second component is the promotion of China's political view of the world, which is based on the belief that the country's progress has been and will remain fundamentally peaceful in nature. According to the Straits Times article, China wants to enhance its soft power through cultural products like TV dramas. Period dramas have long been China's main cultural export. However, in January this year, Chinese authorities banned the broadcast of period dramas in China. For the Chinese government, soft power is important, but the stability within society and the stability of the government is even more important. Early this month, the suspension of uh, period dramas was relaxed. And besides, there are other alternatives available which China can use to spread its soft power. For example, through variety shows such as The Voice of China and Hollywood co-productions. <clears throat> In reference to China's foreign policy strategy, Deng Xiaoping once said, China must hide our capabilities and bide our time. The idea behind this strategy was for China to follow a policy of modernization quietly not to strive for dominance, not to claim leadership, and never to interfere in internal matters of other countries. Former President Hu Jintao also adhered largely to Teng's biding our time policy. For three decades, Chinese foreign policy was implemented accordingly. In recent years, however, President Xi Jinping has overseen an adjustment in China's foreign policy. China's policies and projects, such as the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Massive Belt and Road Initiative and its maritime interests in East Asia are indicators that Beijing is striding ahead to achieve the Chinese dream of great rejuvenation. The three sources on the screen provide different perspectives of China's current and evolving foreign policy. According to the Straits Times article, President Xi says, China's development will not pose a threat to any country. China will never seek a Germany and never engage in expansion. Instead, it will continue to actively participate in the reform and construction of global governance and contribute more Chinese wisdom, plans, and strength to the world. According to the Progress Central article, since 2005, China has expanded its overseas investments to the developed world. For China, this is a milestone in its pursuit of great power status and to be becoming an indisputable global power. And from the China File article, Based on 2017 revisions to the Chinese Communi Communist Party's constitution, President Xi's priorities include building a community with a shared future, enhancing China's cultural soft power, and pursuing the Belt and Road Initiative. According to a Chinese international relations professor, 
China's objective is to achieve what Xi Jinping dubbed the China Dream, which means turning China into a major economic and military power. Everything else comes under this overarching goal. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a comprehensive mega regional trade agreement that will tie 16 countries in the Asia Pacific region, including China. The aim is to strengthen economic links and to enhance trade and investment activities, as well as contribute to minimizing development gaps among the parties. The negotiation includes trade in goods and services, investment, economic and technical cooperation, intellectual property, dispute settlement and e-commerce. China has embarked on what is probably the most ambitious foreign investment campaign in history to boost the long-term prospects of its own economy and to extend its influence. Introduced by presidency in 2013, BRI is the Chinese government's development strategy to build ties along the Overland Silk Road economic belt and naval trading route known as the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. BRI aims to connect more than 70, 70 countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe through sea routes via the South China Sea and Indian Ocean, promoting economic cooperation among countries along those routes. What is the re relevance of BRI to Singapore? We are one of the top recipients of China's BRI outward investments. We enjoy a competitive advantage as a key infrastructure, financial, and legal hub in the region and will add value to Chinese companies expanding along the Belt and Road. Singapore companies can also seize many opportunities to participate in BRI projects in sectors such as infrastructure, trade, transport, professional services, and e-commerce. To read up more on BRI, here are some recommended print and online resources. The Progress article talks about the participation of Southeast Asian countries in the project and the geopolitical consequences. According to the article from the Council on Foreign Relations, BRI serves as a way for China to develop new investment opportunities, cultivate export markets, and boost Chinese incomes and domestic consumption. In the first book, over 30 scholars and political scientists analyze BRI, explore opportunities, challenges, and the impact on the world economy and regions. The second book provides a comprehensive review of the BRI foundations, the economic and legal aspects of uh, the Chinese investment, impact on international trade and dispute resolutions between China and other BRI participants. Next, I will highlight some economic trends in China. Cities referred to as Tier 1.5 or emerging first-tier cities represent those that are not on par with traditional first-tier cities but outshine other traditional Tier 2 cities. According to a 2018 research report on the employment market for graduates in China, 40% of 90,000 graduates surveyed hope to work in so-called emerging first-tier cities such as Chengdu, Hangzhou and Chongqing, while only 27% hope to work in first-tier cities. From the China Daily article, Hangzhou, Chengdu, Suzhou and Xiamen have outperformed Beijing and Shanghai in attracting professionals thanks to their vibrant business growth potential and abundant job opportunities in industries such as the internet sector, real estate, automobiles, financial services, and education management. From the ProQuest article, the Economist Intelligence Unit's 2018 China City Rankings report finds that emerging cities in China with strong growth potential are dominated by cities from the central provinces of Suzhou, Henan, Hubei, Hunan, and Jiangxi. In 2015, China unveiled a national plan called Made in China 2025. It is the first 10-year action plan designed to transform China from a manufacturing giant into a world manufacturing power by rapidly developing 10 high-tech industries. Beijing's ultimate goal is to reduce China's dependence on foreign technology and produce and promote Chinese high-tech manufacturers in the global marketplace. By 2025, China aims to achieve 70% self-sufficiency in high-tech industries, and by 2049, it seeks a dominant position in global markets. <coughs> According to the article from the Council on Foreign Relations, China 2025 is intended to push the Chinese economy 
through the difficult transition from low-value-added, low-wage manufacturing to high-tech, high-productivity economy. The second article is from EBSCOHO's Academic Search Premier. As part of the Made in China 2025 plan, China developed the Robotics Industry Development Plan. This is a five-year plan to rapidly expand its industrial robotics sector. China will achieve 40% of total worldwide robotic sales by this year and is also investing heavily into accompanying technology like machine learning and artificial intelligence. All of this is to construct a highly developed automated workforce. In 2017, China published its Next Generation Artificial Intelligence Development Plan with aims to ultimately become the world leader in artificial intelligence. The first step of that plan is to catch up with the US on AI technology and applications by 2020. According to this report, Mind the AI Gap, published in December 2018, China is currently well ahead of the rest of the industrialized world in AI implementation, with up to 85% of companies identified as active players in AI. The South China Morning Post article says that China now dominates AI funding. The Chinese AI industry has grown 67% over the past year and has produced more patents and research papers than the US. The next two articles from Gov Insider and Xinhua Net highlight that China is striving to gain a lead in the global race towards building an intelligent and data-driven society. It now has 500 smart city pilot projects ready or under construction with an estimated market size of 650 billion yuan. Government officials from cities such as Hangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Xi'an are using computing to improve um, citizen services. The fourth trend is 5G technology, or fifth-generation mobile internet connectivity, which promises 20 times faster data download and upload speeds, wider coverage and more stable connections compared to 4G. When it comes to the 5G network, it is a fierce four-corner fight among the US, China, South Korea and Japan. Both the US and South Korea launched a super-fast 5G mobile network just a few weeks ago. In China, commercial 5G services are not expected to start until late this year, but the country is leading the way in terms of building infrastructure. With strong government support, the country has been installing base stations to build up a vast 5G network. China's wireless operators are also conducting hundreds of large-scale 5G trials across the country. According to the Procred Center article, Huawei owns 36% of all 5G patents. This means that telecom, countries, uh, tel telecom companies around the world will have to pay royalties to Huawei to license that technology. Currently, the US has banned Huawei from selling telecom gear in the US due to concerns that their equipment could be used for espionage. Australia and New Zealand have also blocked Huawei gear in their 5G rollout. However, Huawei is moving ahead with productions of uh, 5G equipment and estimates that 5G will bring industry opportunities worth 1.2 trillion to South Asia and Southeast Asia over the next five years. From the Straits Times article, a report released on 20th March this year says that China is set to become the world's largest 5G market by 2025 with 460 million users. Chinese mobile operators will invest 58 billion over the next two years for 5G rollouts. And by 2023, the mobile communication sector is expected to contribute 6 trillion yuan to China's economy. The third news article reports that a Chinese surgeon has performed the world's first remote brain surgery using 5G technology, with the patient 3,000 kilometers away from the operating doctor. Digital payments refer to payments for products and services over the internet as well as mobile payments via smartphone applications. In 2018, 583 million Chinese made mobile payment transactions totaling 41 trillion. The numbers are expected to double um, when we reach 2023. According to the TechWire article, middle-aged but outbound Chinese tourists are driving, driving mobile payments in over 40 foreign countries. From the second article, according to a recent survey, over 20% of people in China think that digital payments will replace, will replace cash transactions in the future. The South China Morning Post article features a recently launched 
facial recognition ticketing system on trial at a Shenzhen subway station. Instead of using a ticket or scanning a QR code, commuters can scan their faces on a tablet at the entrance and have the fare automatically deducted from their linked accounts. The sixth trend is China's e-commerce delivery market, focusing on last mile delivery. The boom in China's e-commerce, driven by an increase in the number of online shoppers over the last decade, has fired up the e-commerce logistics market, with over 100 million parcels delivered per day in 2018. More e-retailers are moving into log logistics business to control costs and enhance customer experience. The first article from Parcel and Postal Technology describes how JD.com, an online marketplace retailer similar to Amazon, was one of the first companies in China to use drones to make deliveries in rural areas. It also uses autonomous ground vehicles which use facial recognition technology to enable users to easily and securely collect their parcels. JD also offers a white glove service in nine cities where luxury goods are delivered by a driver wearing a suit and white gloves. The second article introduces the autonomous food delivery robot from Meituan Tianping, China's largest on-demand service provider. Onboard sensors and visual recognition intelligence help the robot navigate office buildings, avoiding people and obstacles. Once the robot reaches its destination, an office worker simply types his mobile number into the touch screen and out pops his lunch. Let's turn our attention now to a downward trend which China has been facing. China's GDP, as mentioned earlier, for 2018 was 6.6%. And the Chinese Academy of Social Science, a top government think tank, has forecast growth to slow to 6.3% this year. That would be China's weakest performance in nearly three decades. According to the Foreign Affairs article, wages in China have stagnated, imports have plummeted, and manufacturing companies are slashing jobs. China also faces a rapidly aging population, a falling birth rate, and tighter restrictions on lending to curb rising household debt. The trade war with the US has also damaged the confidence of businesses and consumers, making entrepreneurs less willing to invest and consumers less eager to buy big ticket items like apartments and cars. What is the Chinese government doing to address this? The government is taking measures to rebalance the economy by boosting domestic consumption, which will make growth less dependent on exports and investments. As reported in the Reuters and Straits Times articles, Beijing will implement cuts of nearly 300 billion US dollars in corporate taxes and fees to support the manufacturing transport and construction sectors. China aims to create 13 million new jobs this year and will cut the security, social security fees for employees. State-owned banks will also be instructed to boost lending to SMEs by more than 30%. China's parliament has also recently approved in March of this year a new foreign investment law which includes banning forced technology transfer and addresses the protection of intellectual property rights in China. Reform and opening up has been a bold revolutionary move that has changed the destiny of the Chinese nation and also influenced the world. In its keynote speech at the conference to celebrate China's 40th anniversary of reform and opening up, President Xi said, the practice of reform and opening up over the past 40 years has shown that openness brings progress while seclusion leads to backwardness. China cannot develop itself in isolation from the world and the world needs China for global prosperity. <clears throat> With that, I've come to the end of the first half of tonight's presentation. My colleague Lee Kim will now continue the second half. Good evening, everyone. For the second part of the sharing, I will be focusing on India, the second giant in Asia. Okay, firstly, I will briefly talk about why India is important to Singapore through some of our bilateral co cooperation. Next, I will look at India through an overview of modern India. And finally, I will highlight some of the trends and developments in India today. So I'm not an expert in India, and the information and facts that I'm covering today are actually gleaned from my research using the books from the National Library, from our databases, and from some of the reports that are available online. 
Singapore and India have enjoyed a close relationship since our independence. So back in 1966, a year after Singapore's independence, then Prime Minister Mr Lee Kuan Yew had already visited India where he met then Prime Minister of India Mrs Indira Gandhi. And fast forward to 2018, the current Prime Minister of India Mr Narendra Modi visited Singapore in June 2018 for the Shangri-La Dialogue and met our Prime Minister Lee, uh, Mr Lee Hsien Long. So do, when he was here, he commented that the two lions, meaning Singapore and India, should step into the future together, which is a testament of the close cooperation that we share. In 2015, Singapore and India commemorated 50 years of diplomatic relations. So some of the highlights of our bilateral relations include the signing of the economic, a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement which enhances trade between Singapore and India. It was first signed in 2005 and now it is in its third review. Singapore and India also signed a strategic partnership agreement in 2015 during the commemoration of 50 years of relations which brings cooperation beyond the traditional trade and economy to other areas like defence and security. We also have multiple areas of collaboration with India, such as um, the building of IT parks in urban development and in skills training. So the image here shows the International Tech Park in Gurgaon, India, one of the nine which Singapore has built in India. Okay, in terms of trade and economy, our trade and economic cooperation continue to grow. In 2017, trade between the two countries grew to $25 billion, which is an increase of about 15%. And in the past 18 years, Singapore has been the second highest source of foreign direct investment in India. Meanwhile, the trade between ASEAN and India also grew to $71.6 billion in 2017. And this accounts for only 2.6% of ASEAN's total trade. So both ASEAN and India feel that there is still more potential for trade to grow to even higher levels. So in addition to trade, Singapore has also collaborated with India in other areas, such as in infrastructural development. For example, we are working with India to develop Amaravati, which is the new capital city of Andhra Pradesh, from almost from scratch. Okay, in this next section, I'm going to give a brief overview of modern India in terms of its demographics and economy. So I think the following quote, quote from the World Economic Forum best summarizes India now. Okay, why did the World Economic Forum say that India is a compelling growth story? Firstly, it has shown impressive economic growth over the past few years. India's real GDP growth averages about 6 to 7% and it has been predicted by the Economist Intelligence Unit to maintain at more than 7% in the next few years. Secondly, its GDP based on purchasing power parity is third in the world behind only China and the United States. Okay, India's economy is also expected to overtake traditional powers such as the United States and European Union in the future. By 2030, India is set to become the second largest economy in the world behind only China. And by 2050, the, its GDP will account for 15% of the world's GDP. Okay, next. India is a populous young nation with a population of more than 1.3 billion. And nearly half of this population is below the age of 25. So this large young population will form the largest workforce in the world and become India's most valuable asset. However, such a young, large, large young population is also going to be a pressing challenge for the government because it means that the government has to generate millions of jobs for the young now. Okay, these slides show eight cities that are driving economic growth in India and some of the industry that each city is focusing on. 
So some, such as New Delhi, they are already well established, while others, such as Bangalore and Hyderabad, are the more recent fast-growing cities. In addition, India is also playing a larger role on the world stage by participating in regional and international organisations. So this is a sign of its rising influence in the world. Firstly, India is a member of G20, a group made out of the largest economies in the world that includes the United States, China, European Union, Japan. India is also a member of several other important regional organisations. It is a member of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, comprising of the countries in South Asia. So the SAARC has launched the South Asian, trade, South Asian Free Trade Area, which has the potential to grow trade in the region by more than three times. India is also a member of influential banking organizations, such as the Asian Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Okay, um, India actually is trying to become a permanent member in the United Nations Security Council. So the United Nations Security Council has 15 members, five of which are permanent members who wield veto powers. These five are the United States, China, Russia, United Kingdom and France. And out of these five, four of the permanent members have expressed support for India's bid to become a permanent member. So these four members who have expressed support are the United States, Russia, United Kingdom and France. So their support is actually a form of recognition of India's importance in global defence and security. Okay, um, if you're looking for sources on growth of India, these are some of the books and database I had referred to during my research. Before I proceed to the next segment on the foreign policy, I would like to share the following quote from Prime Minister Modi, which summarizes how India would like the world to see it. Okay, since coming to power, Modi has chosen to focus on India's neighbourhood in a neighbourhood-first policy. So strengthening relations with its neighbours in South Asia is a priority for the government, as can be seen when Modi invited the leaders of all the South Asian nations to his inauguration ceremony in 2014. Since then, he has made official visits to almost all its neighbours in the South Asia, except the Maldives. India has also started the Look East policy in the 1990s to build relations with ASEAN countries. Today, the policy has been expanded to other countries in Asia Pacific under the Act East policy. And when Modi took office in 2014, India also began a Think West policy to work with the Gulf countries in West Asia. India established the Look East policy in early 1990s under Prime Minister Narasimha Rao to establish economic cooperation with ASEAN countries. So at that time, India had faced two major challenges. Internally, it was facing an economic crisis, while externally, its close partner, the Soviet Union, had collapsed. So it needed to look for friends. Since the establishment of the policy, partnership between ASEAN and India has improved tremendously. So from starting out as a sectoral partner in 1992, the relationship has evolved to a strategic partnership today, which includes cooperation in cultural, defence and security aspects. The signing of the ASEAN-India Free Trade Area Agreement in 2010 also led to a rise in trade uh, to US 58.4 billion in 2016. In fact, when India was starting up its Look East policy, the first country they approached was actually Singapore. In 1991 alone, there were already three official visits between both countries. First, the Minister of External Affairs in India visited Singapore and met then Prime Minister Go Chok Tong. 
Then the Minister of Finance, Man Mohan Singh, actually came to Singapore to participate, to attend a conference to encourage investments in India. When he was here for the conference, he said that the government of India thought that to market the new India, they have to start in Singapore. So then, India saw that Singapore was his gateway to ASEAN and even to the rest of the world. And finally, our foreign minister, Mr. Wong Kan Singh, then visited India and met Prime Minister Rao. So after Prime Minister Modi took office in 2014, he expanded the Look East policy to the Act East policy to include countries in Asia-Pacific region. So India also hopes that the Act East policy can help to promote connectivity to its northeast region and bring development to the region because it's a landlocked region. Okay, so here are some of the sources I had referred to during my research on India's foreign policies. Okay, in the next part, I'm going to highlight some of the trends and developments in India. Perhaps the best word to in describe India today is the word opportunity, which is well reflected by this quote from Amazon's vice president. Announced in 2015, the Make in India initiative aims to boost the manufacturing sector and create 100 million jobs by 2022 for India's burgeoning young population. So for years, India has placed emphasis on its service sector, so now it makes up to 55% of its GDP. However, the service sector has not created enough jobs for its large population. So the government hopes to expand the manufacturing sector to create more jobs, especially jobs for the lower skilled workers. The Digital in India Initiative aims to transform India into a digitally empowered society and a knowledge economy. It has seen the introduction of tools and services so that citizens from all corners of India, especially remote areas, can have access to services. For ex instance, Adhar is a unique 12 digit identity number based on the citizen's biometric and demographic information. It is the world's largest biometric ID system. So besides tools and services, India also hopes to transform its economy into a digital economy and tap on the opportunities available. The National Digital Communications Policy 2018 has set a target of reaching one trillion US dollars for the digital economy by 2025. Under this policy, um, the policy aims to drive growth in various areas such as the Internet of Things, Industry 4.0 and emerging technologies like AI, 5G and cloud computing. There are also strategies to promote local manufacturing and to create jobs. So the digital economy is expected to create 4 million jobs by 2025 in fields such as IT, telecoms and cybersecurity. You cannot mention India without mentioning its success in the IT field. So the sector is expected to be worth about 330 billion by 2020, propelled by several factors such as its selection as a champion service sector and growth in new technology. In addition, the sector has the advantage of a large pool of young trained professionals and lower labor costs. India's IT hubs are located in several cities, including in Delhi, Hyderabad, and Bangalore. So Hyderabad is packed as an emerging city in India with high annual growth, while Bangalore is touted to be sil the Silicon Valley of India because of its reputation as India's leading IT exporter. India is actually getting rapidly connected to the internet. It now has the second largest internet market in the world, but yet a majority of the population has yet to be connected. Hence, there is much potential for the growth of this market. 
And many big companies like Google, Amazon and Netflix are eyeing a share of the market because they have been kept out of China, which is the biggest market in the world and largely closed off to foreign companies. So no China, let's go to India. Along with the growth of internet access is the rise of smartphone usage. A survey by Cisco has predicted that there will be 829 million smartphone users in India by 2022. Currently, less than one third of its entire population are smartphone users. And despite the rapid growth of smartphone ownership, it accounts for, India only, accounts for only 12.5% of the market in Asia Pacific. So imagine how many more potential users there are amongst the rest of the population. The boom in internet access and smartphone usage arose when mobile data became affordable for the masses due to intense competition between the telcos. In fact, mobile data is so cheap that it can, you can get um, 28 days, 14 gigabytes of data for only $2. You can never get that kind of rate in Singapore. And as a matter of fact, some remote areas in India may not have basic amenities like clean water, but they have cheap internet access. India also needs to train about 10 million people annually to support its goal of creating 100 million jobs under the Make in India, India initiative. One of the major factors driving the demand for education is the rise of internet penetration and smartphone ownership, which has made education, especially online education, more accessible to the people. So besides formal learning in schools, e-learning is also picking up in India. And the popularity of e-learning can be seen in the growth of various segments such as test preparation and skills certification in the near future. So if the above focus on education, e-learning and reskilling sounds very familiar, that is because Singapore also has a focus in these areas. Singapore has already helped to set up three skill centres in India for vocational training. And these centres seem to be quite popular with the locals, with demand outstripping the number of places in the first centre that was set up in 2013 with the help of our ITE. As the economy of India grows and cities develop, more Indians will be living in cities. According to a report by McKinsey, by 2030, 590 million Indians will be living in cities. Many will be living in the country's seven mega cities, which are cities with more than 10 million inhabitants each. So currently, there are already five mega cities in India, with two more upcoming in 2030 in Hyderabad and Ahmedabad. But with urbanization comes pollution. So based on a study by Greenpeace, seven of the 10 cities with the highest pollution in the world are in India. Because with increased urbanization and industrialization, consumption of energy also increases in India. And for India, its main source of energy is still coal. So air pollution will bring um, Besides health problems, air pollution will bring other problems for India, such as climate change. And climate change will be significant for India because the erratic weather has already stressed India's capacity to produce enough food for its people. And it also threatens the livelihood of 70% of the Indians who depend on agriculture for survival. So many of the Indians still depend on agriculture for survival. And the erratic weather is destroying their crops. Okay, to mitigate the issue of pollution, India has turned its sights towards renewable sources of energy, particularly solar energy. So it has set a target of generating 175 gigawatts of clean energy by 2022, out of which 100 gigawatts will be from solar power alone. 
However, the take-up rate is still very slow despite efforts of the government to promote solar power. So another plan which the government came up with to reduce pollution and increase the standard of living is the Smart Cities Mission. Under the Smart Cities Mission, the government will select 100 cities based on the proposals they submit and they will provide funding for five years for these cities to implement their plans. So some of the ideas that are proposed by the various cities include central control system, which oversees services like Wi-Fi, sensors, surveillance, smart payment networks, and high-tech waste management systems. So the cities are free to provide a proposal, submit the proposal to the government, and in a competitive process, the government will choose 100 proposals, provide the funding to the cities to implement the plans. So smart cities is actually another area where Singapore and India are cooperating in. In 2018, a Singaporean firm was awarded a contract to build a smart city in one of the cities in India. Okay, so these are some of the books and databases I had referred to to do my research on the trends and developments in India. Okay, to end off, I would like to cite a quote from the book The Future is Asian by Dr. Parag Khanna. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. The time has come. The same ingredients that propelled Europe's ascendancy and the United States' rise to superpower status are converging in Asia. In just the past few years, China has surpassed the United States as the world's largest economy and trading power. India has become the fastest growing large economy in the world, and Southeast Asia receives more foreign investment than both India and China. So the 21st century has often been said to be the Asian century, and robust growth and prosperity will be driven by this ascending giants of Asia. Okay, before I close my presentation, the contents that we have presented today are actually taken from the books available at the National Library, otherwise known as the Lee Kong Chien Reference Library. So the books can be located at Level 8, where the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities collections are, and Level 7, where the Business, Science and Technology collections are. A selection of the books and e-books has also been placed at the front and at the back of the room, so please feel free to take a look at them later. Okay, in addition to books, we also refer to journal articles, figures and data from some of our databases. And some of these databases can be accessed from home while others are accessible at the library. To access the databases from home, you can visit the NLB eResources website at the following URL. Log in with a My Library ID and then go to Buy A to Z to search for the database you want. And to access the databases that are only accessible at the libraries, you can connect to the wireless and SG connection provided at our libraries. Then go to the NLBE resources web page as usual, go to A to Z and select the database you want, to, you want to access. Okay, finally, the National Library has created a portal named Eye on Asia, which is meant to be a first stop resource center for resources on ASEAN countries, China, and India. So do visit the website at www.ionasia.sg to take a look. Okay, with that, we've come to the end of our presentation. Thank you for joining us today, and have a good evening.